This is no laughing matter, folks. And this episode, it's not going to be for the faint of heart. We finally reached the bottom of the barrel. We've reached the crusty shit around the poorly wiped, pimply ass that is Crash Bandicoot. We've reached the absolute nadir of the series. The most notoriously shitty game in the history of Crash Bandicoot. Crash. Boom. Bang. Hello and welcome back to, yes, we know the ref is still on strike, yada yada yada. The mid-2000s were very hit and miss for the Orange Bandicoot himself, but none of it compares to what would come in 2006. Excuse me while I reach for the bleach for this one, as this time we're talking about what is simultaneously one of the least known Crash Bandicoot games, and most critically and commercially panned Crash Bandicoot games, Crash Boom Bang, or Crash Bandicoot Festival if you're Japanese. A party game on the Nintendo DS. Excuse me if that doesn't sound like a recipe for absolute majesty. So this time around, Vivendi, or rather, Sierra, now a subsidiary of Vivendi who's taken over publishing duties, spun the wheel of developers, but apparently they were nervous, and spun it so hard that the arrow went flying off the wheel and flew halfway across the world, embedding itself into the Japanese game studio Dimps Corporation, and Vivendi slash Sierra said, meh, close enough. Before I played this game, I assumed that Dimps was some random no-name studio that went defunct in the late thousands like they all did, sealed so Amaze Entertainment, so imagine my shock when I found out that they're not only still around, but they've actually made a lot of high-profile games, including the Dragon Ball Z, Budokai, and Xenoverse games, Street Fighter 4 and 5, and a shitload of Sonic the Hedgehog games. So considering that pedigree, it makes you wonder how something like Crash Boom Bang can be part of their catalog, though to be fair, it was only made by like 10 people in the studio. Crash Boom Bang seems to be the black sheep of the studio, and I'm sure they've made worse games, see Sonic Lost World 3DS for that particular crash course, but never before did they make such a high-profile failure. Well, I say high-profile, Crash Bandicoot is a high-profile franchise, but Boom Bang is anything but. I'd never heard of it until somebody offhandedly mentioned it to me back in 2013, and apparently I'm not the only one, as this is the worst-selling game in the series by far, only selling a mere 90,000 copies. Jesus. It's also the most critically panned Crash Bandicoot game, sitting at 37% on Metacritic. Lame story, boring minigames, derivative poor design, poor balancing, and nothing more than a Crash Bandicoot skin on a bad party game are just some of the criticisms I can decipher from this mountainous mass of hate. This game is infamous, and I felt like I was opening Pandora's box when I had to play it, and right off the bat I'll say that I was wrong. At least Pandora's box contained hope. The fact of the matter is, because I knew I was probably gonna hate this game, and the fact that it's somewhat rare, I didn't even want to bother shelling out money for it, or even checking how expensive it is. How much does it cost? Too much. Fair enough! Which means I'm breaking my own personal rule with this one of at least owning a game before I review it, but to be honest, when it comes to Crash Boom Bang, I don't really think it matters that much. So I'm gonna emulate it. And then probably have my computer exercised. Wait, where'd it go? So let's take a look at self-fulfilling prophecy the game, Crash Boom Banging My Head Between Two Bricks. So how does one really approach a game like Crash Boom Bang? With a brick? With a scalpel? With a sledgehammer? With a jackhammer? With a jackknife? With a jackknife powerbomb? With New Jack? How about all of the above? 
Well, I guess by examining party games as a whole, what is the purpose of a party game? In general, the purpose is to provide a game or host of games to be played in a social situation, with single-player content usually being a distant second priority. Things like Rock Band, Mario Party, or the Jackbox series being exemplars of this. I guess the closest comparison to Crash Boom Bang has to be Crash Bash, what with it being the only other party game in the series, unless you count Purple, which personally I don't, because to be a party game, you first have to be a game. While I didn't particularly like Crash Bash, it did what it needed to do well enough, provided you a selection of uninventive and unchallenging, but nonetheless enjoyable minigames for you to play with three other friends at 2am while there's about three liters of vodka distributed throughout. In that respect, it succeeded, I guess, even for as insubstantial as it was as a full package. Crash Boom Bang tries to do the same thing, but I shouldn't need to be the one to tell you that it failed miserably. Shamefully, it does show signs of life. Right off the bat, I'll say that this game has a more central focus than Crash Bash, what with it having a core mechanic that it builds everything off of, it's just that it's a very blatant ripoff of Mario Party, but you know, rough with the smooth. That also means that this game can frame the action in a more coherent way that makes sense within the context of the game. So Crash Boom Bang doesn't necessarily do everything wrong, but really, these are just tiny vestigial aspects of the game that don't really add or mean anything. This is basically like being on a crashing airplane and saying, boy, these peanuts sure are good. And whatever this game is or attempts to be starts to fall apart from the moment I boot up the game and see the character designs. We only start with four characters at first, Crash, Pinstripe, Coco, and Pura. Crash and Pinstripe look decent save for Crash's big, goofy, permanent smile, which in the context of the game comes across as hollow and forced, like a depressed theme park mascot, but then you have Pura, who's not only standing on his hind legs, but is wearing pants. It looks nothing like Pura. And then you have Coco. In short, the fuck? What did they do to her? She looks like an orangutan in a crop top. Her arms almost go down to her feet. The thing on her face is like a reverse beard, and she doesn't even look slightly like the character she's supposed to resemble. So because this clearly isn't Coco, as it looks nothing like her, instead of calling her Coco, I'm gonna go the fake crash route and call her fake Coco. Kaka, if you would. Because I am the most mature person. Then you have the rest. Crunch actually looks decently accurate. Ta- oh. No. They finally let Tana make a comeback after 10 years, and it's in the most critically panned game in the series. Welcome back, Tana. Go fuck yourself. She looks, I don't know, unrecognizable? You could name her anything else and it would mean precisely as much. She looks pretty repulsive with the long arms and what have you, not quite on the level of Coco, but getting there. And this may be reaching for the low-hanging fruit, but Tana is anything if not a low-hanging fruit. She looks like a hooker. Like, let's be frank. Fake Crash looks fine, if a bit bland, but at the very least, he looks like who he's supposed to look like. And Court... <laughs> Well, alrighty then. If Crash Twin Sanity didn't do enough to ruin your perception of Cortex, then Crash Boom Bang comes in for the save and makes him into a grouchy, surly midget with proportions so squished that it looks like somebody fucked up his aspect ratio or maybe put him into a motorized giant clamp and compressed him. He also looks like he has a scullet afro and a mohawk. This is one of the worst character designs I've ever seen. There are other brief cameos by other characters ranging from Engine Good to Tiny Bad... You know when you see something so bewildering that your mind is filled with both everything and nothing at the same time? That. Well, there looks to be shit spewing from his eyes, or are those eyebrows. He appears to be wearing bento grass around his waist, there's a turtle shell on his stomach, he looks to have been put through the dryer since we last saw him, and taking a look at his face, he looks to have lost a few chromosomes in the wash as well. I'm not against redesigns. This series has been constantly playing around with the designs of these characters, but this game goes so far in the direction of redesigns that many of these characters are completely unrecognizable and just plain ugly, and that really is just the summation. They all look ugly. Also, I know Notice that all the characters have this weird white outline around them. It's really ugly. I guess I should talk about the graphics as a whole, but what is there really to say? To be honest, it doesn't have much in the way of graphics. It's a DS game, so I'm not gonna harp on it for having a low pixel count, but here's the thing. There are ways to make DS games look good, and by proxy, there were good-looking DS games. Many of the first-party games, like Mario 64 DS, the DS Legend of Zelda games, and Metroid Prime Hunters come to mind, as well as some third-party games like Kingdom Hearts Another One, The World Ends With You, and even something like GTA Chinatown Wars. The distinction is that a lot of these games games used the DS's limitations to their advantage, and made great use of color and style to create an aesthetic that transcended the hardware. Crash Boom Bang, on the other hand, just looks... dull. 
Completely uncharacteristically among Crash Bandicoot games, it just looks kinda drab. There are a few too many boring city, underwater, or even sewer sections. Even the environments that should look nice, like a giant castle, a volcano, or a desert island, don't really pop at all. It all just looks lifeless. The models are about as good as you could expect given the DS hardware. The environments are dense and at times richly detailed, but that doesn't really mean anything if it's not easy on the eyes. And if these environments aren't dull, they're drab. If they're not drab, they're murky, and environments are half the Mario Party style pie. Even worse is that they're simply static. Occasionally you may find a car driving by at 5 miles an hour, or a lava fall that looks to be moving in slow motion, but simply put, this game might as well be taking place while time is frozen for how lively or rather unlively these levels are. Even from what I've seen of the skyboxes, they're just flat motionless gradients, and even the water, for as nice of a shade of blue as it is, it's just completely motionless, so it might as well just be a featureless blue texture, and some of these animations are just abysmal. I mean, this game doesn't even animate much to begin with, 90% of the game is spent looking at this. Cheap walk cycles! They don't even do the walk cycle well because the animation speed and distance has no correlation to the actual distance these characters travel, so it's like they're walking on invisible treadmills. Not to mention, they tended to clip into the environment whenever they were expected to do anything more complicated than walk in a straight line, and the shit they would do to get around having to actually animate anything is both funny and pathetic. Like, whenever they try and make a boat move on the water, it looks like it's sitting completely still on the water with the water texture warping in such a way to simulate movement and that's because that's exactly what it's doing. We're zooming out on a still image to simulate movement and it could not look more amateur. Amateur is a good descriptor for the graphics as a whole. Funny thing too, if they just put a little bit more effort in, spruced up the models, added some color, made the game animate more and better, and maybe stylized the graphics a bit more to take advantage of the DS hardware a bit more, this game could have looked good. I could have also seen this game looking good if it was on more powerful hardware. It's not the ugliest game I've ever played, don't get me wrong, it's just very unappealing to look at. It's very minimalistic. Beyond the board game environments, the four models you see at a time, and some of the aspects of the minigames, there really aren't any unique graphics. Some of these minigames look like there was some skill in making, but otherwise it looks like something so static and boring that it could have been cobbled together in a weekend by any competent developer. I also had some performance issues, but I guarantee you that was just the emulation. It runs fine on standard hardware from what I've seen. It almost runs too quickly on native hardware, but that's neither here nor there. So really, this game just looks amateur, but more to the point, boring. Boring character models, boring environments, boring animation, and just all around boring to look at, which ends up boring the fuck out of me. And the DS had potential to create things that were so much better, like there is one aspect of this game that does realize some of its potential, the DS never had the best sound quality. I played Guitar Hero Modern Hits on it back in the day, and hearing some of those songs through the DS speakers sounded like muffled ass, but that's not to discredit the DS. The fact that they could even make a Guitar Hero game, or 3, and make some of the songs sound reasonably good is a testament to how good a DS soundtrack could sound, and so an instrumental soundtrack should be no problem, but Crash Boom Bang disagrees. The funny thing is, while I was recording this game, I had to mute it because the soundtrack sounded so shrill, it sounded like it was being made exclusively for a mid-90s PC speaker. But the funny thing is, once I listened to the individual pieces after they'd been ripped from the game, they sounded fine. I was gonna come out here and say that they sounded like chiptune diarrhea, but apparently that's not the case. To be honest, it's not bad. The OST surprised me at times because there were some genuinely well-made pieces. For example, it comes out guns a with the title screen as usual. But then we launch directly into the menu theme. And I especially like the city themes, which sound appealingly jazzy. Beyond that, my issue is mostly how much of this soundtrack resembles really lazy elevator music, something meant to be played in the background and not really meant to be paid attention to. It's pretty chill, but that doesn't match the competitive chaotic atmosphere that this game goes for. Though to be fair, the gameplay doesn't either. It's something that I could sooner fall asleep to than play in the background of a competitive matchup. For example, this is the piece played over the boss battles. This sounds like it would be played out of a church organ sooner than a boss fight. But to give credit where credit's due, there are actually some pieces on this soundtrack that I could see myself playing from time to time, but some of them just sound unappealing. 
So it's a soundtrack of two halves. On one hand, genuinely melodious music that's nice to listen to, and on the other hand, poorly composed pieces that are either irritating or lazy, and it gets very samey and very repetitive very quickly. Too much for me to really get into. Many of these pieces are only 30 second loops that barely change anything up, and some of them get down to the low 20s or even the high teens. There's approximately 14 minutes of unique music in this game, and that's kind of pitiful. I'm glad I didn't have to come on here and make jokes like, Jesus shaped flapjacks, my ears are bleeding, because I was fully prepared to do so after I first started the game up, but while there is some good to be had, there's a disordered amount of pieces that make me want to take a nap while listening to them, but that's a statement for the whole game, frankly. The sound design is non-existent, there were so few sound effects that played throughout the game, and they definitely sounded like muffled ass. One that I committed to memory was the slapping sound when you're on horseback. But it's impressive the amount of corner cutting they took with the sound design, especially in the cutscenes which are just glorified comic book panels that looked and sounded to be printing while we were reading them, but really, even if this game was made using top of the line James Cameron style CGI, would it have made the story any less insubstantial? Nope. So the story is, there's this rich millionaire named the Viscount who's seeking out the legendary super big power crystal. They couldn't come up with a better name than that? That his grandfather died searching for, which has the power to grant whoever finds it a wish for anything they so desire. A trope I've seen about 110 squillion times. He needs three items, a map, a stone tablet, and a key to find said crystal. To do this, he creates a competition called the World Cannonball Race, and all I can think about when I hear that is the movie Cannonball Run. I always wanted to be Captain America! The grand prize of said race being a hundred million dollars. He specifically fingers Crash and Company for reasons. He just says he knows the people for the job, and they're the ones he chooses. They just agree to it despite it sounding very suspicious for a number of reasons, such as why would anybody just give away a hundred million dollars, why would they specifically be invited, why does this alleged race include the collection of random MacGuffins and menial tasks for reasons the host won't tell us, but regardless, this sets the scene for a set of six levels where we either race to the end or collect items as the situation calls for it. I like that they're able to frame the action in a way that makes some sort of logical sense, and I like that it's very out of the way. In fact, the story is so out of the way that I'm feeling rather undercut. There's barely anything to critique, but balls to it, I'm gonna goddamn try because I'm anything if not a petty nitpicky bitch. Because this story barely exists, neither do the characters. It's another case of if you didn't play the previous games, every character in this game would be absolute nothing characters, but then again, why would anybody other than fans pick this game up in the first place? And more to the point, why would anybody pick it up in general? The only person to get any level of fleshing out would be the Viscount himself, but even he's plain white bread bland. We don't even know what his motivations were. He still keeps the competition going even after he has to explain his intentions to everybody, including the offer of prize money, and I took everybody continuing with the competition as a sign of, well, maybe this guy's worth helping. We can assume he was evil because he's literally a mustache twirling villain, but for all we know, he's a sentimental man trying to fulfill his grandfather's final wish. So when spoilers, it's all taken away from him in the end, how are we to know that it was a good or bad thing? They clearly intended for it to be unambiguous that it was all for the best that he didn't get his hands on the crystal, and if that's what they were going for, why didn't they tell me anything or establish a reason? So maybe he's the sympathetic one. We don't know. We're assuming who the good guys are based on our preconceived notions about the series rather than anything the game actually tells us. And on the note of the good guys, you know how in previous games it actually made some level of sense when characters showed up even if their inclusions were shoehorned? Well, now we don't even get that. They just appear. Not even when the story demands it, they just appear randomly in the background. Say, weren't there less of you before? Yes. Well, okay then. Is there anything I liked? Well, to be honest, there was so little for me to talk about that even finding things I didn't like was hard. I don't know, there were a few good lines here and there, like when the Viscount is explaining his grandfather's backstory, somebody quips, That sounds like a movie! I like that this game is relatively story light, so even though it wasn't very good, I could still ignore it, which is good, because for all intents and purposes, everything we're given kinda sucks. I think it ends in a really weird way too. So after the final level, the gang makes it to the super big power crystal. Ugh. Still a terrible name. So this is the thing that the Viscount has been trying to obtain the entire game, and what happens? Crash literally just steps past the Viscount when he was completely fine mentally and physically and gets to the crystal before him. Son of a bitch pulls a king of red lions, but the difference is that unlike Ganondorf, the Viscount wasn't even distracted, so what does Crash do with this game's equivalent of the Triforce or the Dragon Balls? He wishes for a buttload of Wumpa Fruit. That was the explosive climax! Thanks for coming, door on the left. No refunds. Not even a final boss to be had. So anticlimactic. And then Coco says one of the dumbest lines in the history of video games. One second. 
<laughs> what? What? Where did this come from? Why is it a thing? It's one of the most random, ill-fitting lines ever. Damn, it just comes out of nowhere. But I guess much like Crash Bash, none of this is what you're here for. It's not a good story, and if they couldn't make a compelling story as a framing device with all the characters meaning something, why'd they even try? But it's not an aspect of the game so big that it really matters. This is all light salad dressing to give context to the gameplay, and in that respect, it does the job as well as you could expect, I suppose. What does it matter as long as the game is fun as a party game, right? <laughs> Spoilers! It's not. So I'm gonna have to reach my hand real deep into the puckered a-hole that is this game to explain in no uncertain terms why. This is a party game in a very Nintendo way. What I mean is that this game is a shameless ripoff of Mario Party. It's all framed around board game type levels, and every now and again you'll have to play some sort of mini game based around a competitive structure for points. In this case, Wumper Fruit. Whoever ends the level with the most points wins. Aside from collecting points by winning mini games, you collect them by landing on Wumper Fruit spaces, betting on mini games you're not involved in or completing objectives, but you also lose Wumper Fruit by landing on various types of hazard spaces. The objectives are either simply getting to the end or collecting MacGuffins by landing on random squares. You play minigames when you land on a minigame square or happen to land on the same spot as another character. You also pick up a new item if you land on the item crate space. You can use various items at the beginning of your turn for various effects, advantages, or disadvantages. Some items like spatulas are required for progression in some levels, then there are the hazards and transporters on the map that take you to sub-areas on the map which may contain hazards or new items that you need to progress, so it's really a standard party game on the surface, right? Yeah, if you're looking at it from the surface level, but this game is let down by a hundred different flaws that kill the experience in various ways. Above all, this game's fatal flaw is that it's ridiculously, ludicrously, trapped in a round room with nothing but a copy of Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time doll. This game is the Cthulhu of boredom. This game is the textbook definition of crushingly tedious. If I was captured by the Order of Blessed Agonies and they needed a quick fix for an agony of the mind, this game would be an endless source. Now let's see how many people know what I'm talking about. It's the type of game that playing it at the peak of my daily energy, coffee included, completely drains me after an hour. I've never played a game that's left me so paralyzed and drained with boredom. Have I hammered that point home thoroughly enough, I wonder? Part of that has to do with how slow each turn moves along. It starts out with Aku Aku repeating literally everything he says at the beginning of every turn, even though everything he's said he's already told you a hundred times and you've already done a hundred times. There comes a point where enough is simply enough and I know what I'm doing. Stop tutorializing me every turn. I'm not that dumb contrary to popular belief. Then you have to painstakingly waste time by watching every single person use their items one after another, and by manually selecting the direction every time you start a turn, even if there's only one way to go. Then you have to wait for everyone to move. You have to wait for every single person to finish moving. The movement is already slow enough, and now we have to wait for everyone to finish moving with the same slow speed, and then you have to wait and watch the same animations play out if you happen to step on a hazard, or even if it's just a regular Wumpa Square. It's just a waste of time. That's all the boring, sloggy issues I have while the game is in motion. We haven't even started talking about the basic design of the game, or rather the poor game design. You know how I said that this game has some levels where you have to locate MacGuffins by landing on random squares? Why is that a thing? So you won't know how long each game will take because it's a complete shit toss as to where these items are or how long they'll take to collect because who knows if you'll be able to roll the exact amount to land on that blank space or even if it's on that blank space. Sometimes they'll be in sub areas of the map and you won't know unless you go there and hope to find it. The only place these items can be are on these blank spaces, so at least you know where to go, and if you happen to have a magnifying glass, you can see where these collectibles are, but then there's this kicker. Even if you know where these items are, some of them are under spaces, so you need to flip spaces over in order to get these items. But here's the catch. You need a spatula to flip over these spaces, which is a one-use item. Let me get this straight. Progression is tied to finite items. Why? Why the fuck do you have key items needed for progression tied to finite items that don't appear that often? That is a weaponizable grade level of stupidity. So if you don't have a spatula, you have to wander around hoping to land on an item crate and hope that you just randomly get a spatula out of every item you can get, of which there's like 30. Honestly, there are some items that are useful like the travel path, the crazy compass, the power crystal, the tricycle, and the big sneakers both as offensive and defensive items, but it all pales in comparison to the spatula 
spatula and the magnifying glass, which are practically mandatory, especially in the spatula's case. Get as many of those as quickly as possible and hold on tight, and especially the domino because that does what the spatula does, but for every space. On the second city level, I had two pieces of the map hidden under spaces that I had to flip over, and so I wandered around for turn after turn after turn after turn, just waiting for someone anyone to flip over these spaces and get the map pieces to just end the level. I didn't care who, I just wanted to end the level, but it just never ended. It just went on, and on, and on, and on, and on. Finally, I was able to shop for items because if you have a sale item, you can shop for items instead of betting on mini games that you're not involved in. But once again, you can only shop if two characters that don't include yourself land on the same space. So everything's random. Why can't I just shop whenever I have a shop item? You can play one of these levels where you have to collect items for 5 turns or 35 turns. Even when you do flip these spaces over, there's no guarantee that you'll get these items right away because you're at the whims of random rolls. So it could take several turns just to land on the right space in order to complete the level, but even then, these rolls seem to be predetermined. Even when I reloaded a save state, I still rolled the exact same roll without fault, which makes this game seem just predetermined. So it makes me wonder what's even the point if this game arbitrarily decides how well I'm gonna do. So this game not only seems terribly designed, but it also seems like it's just guiding me along like a rabbit chasing a carrot because there's almost nothing organic about it. There's very little that I personally affect, so what's even the point of playing it when I'm not having any practical effect and losing doesn't seem to have any inverse effects, and I'll explain why in a moment. The most interesting thing this game has are these little cards that you can bring up and people can bring up on your screen to distract you. It can also be really annoying such as in the Atlas Atmosphere games where the atmosphere stylus controls are very slippery and the game is very fast and so you need to be able to see where you're going. So that bit of trolling affected me at times and even in this very mini game made me lose at one point. Not that it mattered, which is a shame because the downhill atmosphere race actually had some potential. I could see this one being fun if I didn't have so many distractions, but nope, squandered by the terrible presentation this game in a nutshell. But these cards are an interesting idea in concept because you can make your own custom ones with a rather extensive level of options for customization. And when I was recording this game, I wanted to make a custom card that expressed my own feelings about this game. <laughs> Once again, I like this idea in concept, but the whole thing with cards doesn't really come up much unless you're playing multiplayer, so you can mess with your friends with a customized piece of art, and if you can convince three other people to play this game, you're either a mutant in an insane asylum or a cult leader, but otherwise they're just a nuisance that get in your way when you're playing. If I had a piece of broken glass for every time I had to have kawaii koko wink at me, then I would have enough to fill an above ground pool, then I'd jump in head first so I wouldn't have to play this game anymore. Am I being melodramatic enough? These levels where you need to make it to the end are tolerable, but on those levels, every other space is designed to set you back or take you to a secondary level. I remember the point in which I just gave up and stopped playing this game was after a particularly boring 20 minute play session, and after I tried to warp away from this desert island in the first level, I immediately got warped back when Pinstripe used the crazy compass, and I said, No! No, no, no! 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 Okay? That officially passes my bullshit threshold. Okay? Fuck this game, I'm never playing it again! Oh poop. The pacing is just terrible. Every single thing about this game is specifically designed to delay the game ad nauseum. If you don't have to go around hoping people find the randomly generated critical items, then you have to go around hoping that somebody gets to the end just to end the level and move on. It's funny because you'd think that I wouldn't want anybody else to get these objectives because the bonus points for getting these objectives are so high, but that's the funny thing because, well, I'll let Drew Carey say it. Welcome to Crash Boom Bang, where the game sucks and the points don't matter. It didn't matter who had the most points. Even if you came dead last, the game still went on to the next level regardless, points and all. I finished the story with nearly twice the points of the next person after crawling back from last place. I'm in last place. On one hand, I like that the story continued regardless of who had the most points because it just meant that I didn't have to play the game for as long, but what was even the point of having the point system? Just an arbitrary ranking system to determine who won and lost a pointless inorganic struggle to make this seem like a video game when in actuality it's just a glorified borderline predetermined interactive playroom where everyone gets participation awards? Is this even a game if you can't lose and the primary prize for winning and the only reason to play is absolutely useless? That is a good question. Is this game? I still tried to win just so I could get through it as fast as possible. You know, 
You'd think I'd be surprised by that, but at this point, no, not really. So fuck competition and challenge, we're just gonna play pretend. Speaking of non-challenge, let's talk about the bread and butter of this type of game, the mini-games. These are some of the most lazy non-games I've ever seen. I remember when I used to play Mario Party DS a lot, I sometimes went in and played a selection of mini-games that I liked because I just found them fun enough to enjoy standalone. That's the basis of a good party game. Good mini-games. Even Crash Bash got this right, despite some of those mini-games being mediocre or just terrible, there were at least some good mini-games in the lot. But here we have not a single good minigame. They're all incredibly generic games you could come up with in five minutes. There's one where you have to blow into a balloon by blowing into the DS mic, there's a card shuffle game, there's a guess the differences between these two scenes game, there's a pick the right person minigame, pool, a mini golf game where the hole is literally right in front of you, four way pinball, a race downhill, and so on. God damn, there were better minigames in The Legend of Dragoon! Things anyone could think of. Basically, the insert DS minigame here type of games, and they all suck. Like, the balloon minigame is just blow into the mic. How exciting? For the mini golf, I just move the stylus forward. For this feather game, I just blow into the mic. Again, only here you only sometimes blow. It's just so boring and static, where you just do one thing for a full minute. Who actually thought that a mini game where you throw Wumpa Fruit into baskets for a full minute was a good idea, or blowing a feather in the air and keeping it at a certain height for a full minute? It's just so instantly repetitive. So what is it about this game that could be considered good? The main game, which is dull and slow as fuck, is meant to complement the mini games, which are also boring as fuck. Sometimes the amount of points you have has no correlation with who wins. Sometimes people have the exact same amount of points and the game would just pick someone to win. Or at times people would have more points and someone else would win. Another big problem with so many of these mini games is that they're all so insultingly easy. Like there's this one game where you have to guess based on a silhouette who a character is and more often than not it's so insultingly piss easy that it makes me want to roll my eyes. The first time I played the mini golf game I got it in one shot without even trying. The card shuffle game was so easy it wasn't even funny, at one point I wasn't even paying attention and I still got it, and so on. But then you have the ones that go in the complete opposite direction. Usually the only times I lost were just because in some cases I got screwed over or the mechanics aren't well explained or you're not told key components. Like the balloon game will tell you that if you inflate the balloon too much that the balloon will pop, but it doesn't tell you exactly what the point is that it'll blow up. Like how big is too big? There's this baseball one where you're supposed to guess based on where the pitcher is the direction the ball's going, and while you can easily tell the horizontal plane that the ball is going, there's no clear way to tell the vertical plane the ball is going to travel, and so I ended up missing almost every one because I had no idea how I was supposed to know where I was supposed to hit. This is without a doubt the worst mini game in the entire game, and that's saying something. Another one is the horse racing mini game. Honestly, I know all these games have names, but I couldn't be asked to commit any of them to memory because they were so forgettable. It tells me to tap the screen to make the horse go faster, but then when I do that, suddenly after an arbitrary amount of time I can't do that anymore. Did the game tell me? Me this was going to happen? That should have been front and center because it's something that I missed. Even that aside, tap the screen? How exciting. I've probably just spent more time talking about this horse racing game than the developers did. There are these things that I think are supposed to be boss fights, but they're kinda lame. The only thing that determines them being boss fights are that they all involve fighting the Viscount in some way. They, for the most part, are the most interesting mini-games, but that's not saying much. There's this one where you have to shoot the Viscount, the person who shoots him the most while taking the least amount of fire wins, there's this one where you need to shoot at Viscount targets, there's this one where you're in a mech-style suit and have to punch him while avoiding his AoE attacks, this glorified whack-a-mole game, and the briefly aforementioned four-way pinball game. Many of these games I classify as almost good because they're presented well, and how many places can you witness a four-on-one gangbang with robots? Don't answer that. But what it all amounts to is just pressing the screen at times. Press the screen when a target appears, press the screen when the Viscount pops out of his hole, press the screen to punch a giant robot. Such riveting gameplay when there's absolutely nothing more to do than just press the screen. Plus, the people you're competing against can attack you, thereby handicapping you, so it can also be frustrating. The only decent one is the one where you're in a plane, because that's the only one that has anything to it, in that you have to manually fly, avoid other people and hazards, and shoot a target. So it's a breath of fresh air in a sea of stagnant used bathwater of the world's sweatiest man. By the end, I was just trying to get through some of these mini-games as quickly as possible, because they were just so soul-suckingly boring, and according to 
to Wikipedia, before I rage quit, I'd only played about half the minigames. I can't imagine what the other half are like, but a paint drying simulator wouldn't be too out of place, and the funny thing is, it would still be better than half of what we got. Though, funny thing, the controls are mostly pretty decent aside from the atmosphere, but that's because they had no choice but to be decent, because so many of these games are so simple, many of them just coming down to one button commands or simple touchscreen prompts, but for what it's worth, even the ones that require a bit more finesse control about as well as you'd expect. Each of these minigames are map specific, so you can only play a small pool of minigames for every map you play, all based around said environment, which is a load of butts. I had to play that damn balloon game like 10 times. As I mentioned earlier, whenever you have an all CPU game, you have to sit through it and watch it in painstaking slow detail, which begs the question. Why? Even though it was an opportunity with the betting for extra Wumper Fruit, which as we've previously established is already a useless prize, why do we have to sit back and watch the minigame play out? Because it's just boring. How about just let the game simulate the minigame and put us right back on the board for the next turn like Mario Party DS did? Even when I went into the item shop instead of watching the minigame play out, we still have to sit back and wait, instead of being able to leave the shop whenever I want to go back to the game. So no matter what, I still have to wait. Wow. I am ashamed to admit, I actually did catch myself having fun for a few minutes at one point. It was within the first 20 minutes of the game. There was a point where I felt the game was moving at a decent pace, and while I was playing this one game where I was flying in a plane collecting Wumper Fruit and shooting down the people I was playing with, I thought, hey, maybe this game isn't so bad. All things considered, that minigame is actually probably the highlight of the game for me because there are actually balls to keep in the air and things to do. If the entire game was like this with simple depth, then I would probably be talking about a much different game, but then that fleeting moment of fun sank within minutes as things went along and I got to experience everything else this game had to offer. The cherry on top is that we had something that was so close to being good because it was based on something that was good. At one point, we got to play a minigame in the style of ballistics from Crash Bash. Here's the issue though. Here Here's a clip of Crash Ball from Crash Bash. And here's a clip of the same thing from Boom Bang. I can make no better example about how unexciting Crash Boom Bang is. It's slow, repetitive, with nothing going on, with everything being too basic, and it all has the depth of a spoon. It's so insulting because we've seen how fast-paced and exciting it can be, and how much simple depth like the Power Pulse in Crash Bash adds. That's just an allegory for the entire game. Everything I just said in regards to this ballistic-style minigame can be applied to the entirety of Crash Boom Bang. No matter what this game tries to do, it's insultingly boring or bullshit, from the basic movements on the board game to the progression of the minigames, and everything in between. By the end, I was just trying to get through this game as fast as possible. I know I mentioned that before, but it bears repeating. I was loading my save states every time I hit a hazard because after a few short hours, I just wanted to see this end. I had e fucking enough. I was powering through. I didn't care who won. I just wanted to get it over with. And considering that games are the things I use to escape from my workaday life, a game feeling like work is, shall we say, quite a bad thing. You know, it's kind of apropos that this game ends on what looks like like a Dracula castle because this game is vampiring away my will to live. Ooh, I made a spaghetti! After examining this entire game, I pause for a moment to ask, what does Crash Bandicoot and company really add to this game? In Crash Bash, there were game modes that built upon the ideas and concepts pre-established in the series, as well as including locations from previous games and music that felt distinctly Crash-like. It was to the point that if you took out Crash and company from Crash Bash and replaced them with, say, Star Fox characters, it would still feel like a Crash Bandicoot game, but if you take out Crash Bandicoot and everything that comes with that in this game, it doesn't feel like Crash Bandicoot. It would just feel like a crap soulless Mario Party ripoff without an identity, so the answer to the question what does the Crash Bandicoot brand add to this game is fuck all. It's a glorified Mario Party ripoff with its only notable features being a bunch of Crash Bandicoot characters just plonked in for the sake of brand recognition, and even then not really because so many of these characters are just unrecognizable. Aside from a few decent musical pieces, pretty much everything in this game is just terrible, and obviously I don't need to tell you this because it's practically common knowledge at this point among the Crash Bandicoot community. Every Everything from the slow character movement to the constant repeating of the same lines every turn to the insistence on having to select the direction every turn even if there's only one direction to go, to having to watch every player use their items individually to the slow dialogue speed, to having to wait for every other character to move before the next turn, to having to sit through every minigame regardless of if I'm involved or not, to the minigames themselves, everything, everything, everything is designed specifically to piss me the hell off and bore me to tears. This game's ugly, the characters are ugly, and every aspect of this game is just terribly designed 
and frustrating as hell. I say that Crash Bash is fun as a party game, so if you got some friends around, it would suffice as entertainment because practically everything is fun with friends, but I don't even think Crash Boom Bang would be good in that respect because it's so ungodly dull. So breaking news, bad game continues to be bad. But here's the twist. This game is awful, and objectively speaking is probably the worst game in the series with the worst design, but it's not my least favorite in the series. Crash Purple and Wrath of Cortex were a special kind of bad that made me not only hate them, but also made me angry at their very existence. There was a certain oomph about them, a certain je ne sais quoi, if you will, that pushed them over the edge for me, whereas Crash Boom Bang is just a game that, while I hate, it doesn't give me the urge to get worked up. It just makes me bored, tired, like I want to take a nap. Do I hate this game? Absolutely. Will I remember it tomorrow? Sorry, what were we talking about again? Ha! <laughs> I guess this really does mean this game is a bored game. Except it's bored with an E. But just for old time's sake. Honestly, fuck this game. Fuck it with a rusty spatula. Fuck anybody who bought this game. Fuck anybody who likes this game. Fuck Dimps for making it. Fuck Sierra for publishing it. Fuck Vivendi for owning Sierra. Fuck Shania Twain. For various reasons. Fuck the former presidents of the United States. Fuck the current president of the United States. Fuck any future presidents of the United States. Fuck former professional wrestler Ron Shaw. Fuck you. Fuck me. Fuck the world. Fuck everything. Now have a good fucking night! Now fuck off!